Kant here that essentially organized all matter in creation, in the universe, however you want to think about it. And again, this has been known about for quite some time. Here are um, the Cialdini press, um, plates. And um, he was, this guy um, lived in the 17 to 1800s. He was a German physicist and musician. And um, he discovered that um, if he made these metal plates and put sand on them and then took the bow from a violin and stroked it down the side of the plate, that when he created different notes in the musical scale, that the sand would automatically jump on the plate to create these geometric shapes. And this was quite a revelation at the time. Although I'm sure actually it's been known about for a very, very long time. Um, and this gives, this is kind of the best example of how sound organises matter. And um, it's obviously got more sophisticated over the years. Here are some of the shapes that um, were created by um, different um, notes and also scales in, um, in music. And you can see that they are really geometric And um, here you're looking at um, a slide uh, made by a, a physicist called Hans Jenny, or Hans Jenny, um, in the, um, probably in the 1950s. And Hans Jenny was very fascinated by um, these ideas of how um, vibration affected matter. And so he created um, um, a kind of a device really um, to, to look into the matter look into the matter. And here what you can see in this picture is kind of like a bird's eye view down into some water. And on the top of the water is oil of turpentine. The the whole thing is lit from below so you can see the light source and it's coming through. And the water and oil are vibrated together using an oscillator. And as you create different vibrations, the oil and the water come together to create these fantastic patterns. And this is one. I think there's a, another one here. And I highly recommend Hans Jenny's book to you called Cymatics. And there is also a video, a DVD that you can get online, which actually shows you some of this working in real time. And it is just amazing. It's like watching spirit animating matter. It's absolutely fantastic. It really gets you when you're watching it. Um, and um, and, I, and I think this was understood as long, as, as long ago as the ancient Egyptians. I think ancient Egyptians used sound in ways that we have forgotten completely. Um, and we were talking earlier about you know, the, um, the marriage of some geometries like the square and the circle. And, um, and I just wanted to say something about <coughs> sacred space. I'm just going to go through these because these are just some of the themes and some more crop circles for you to look at. <coughs> the one in yellow there appeared the... Um, the year of the total eclipse in the UK. This is the inner solar system, but the Earth is missing, probably because that's where we are. It gives you the sort of location. Here's some fractals that we, we won't have time to go too much into these today, but these are just some fractals for you to look at. This is the Mandelbrot set. Snowflakes. I I'm, I'm just want to say something about sacred space. We were talking earlier about the marriage of the circle and the square, and actually you see that all the time in temples and church building all over. You know, you see the central square of the cross in the cathedral with the dome on the top. And that, you know, this whole process moves into architecture so that you have this marriage of the circle and the square coming together, which creates the sacred space. It's the bit where 
God and man come together. And um, and so, you, you know, you see this all the time, right back to, you know, I guess the um, um, the Pantheon, you know, I mean, that, that sort of dome over the, the square and everything. So this is about creating a sacred space. And when you begin to think about geometry as frozen music, which is what it really is, then you can begin to understand how things like um, sacred buildings and crop circles have an effect on the psyche. I mean, just think of how you were feeling when you were listening to that music just a little minute ago. You know, how it kind of lifts the spirit and the spirit soars when it, when it listens to certain inspirational music. And in a sense, sacred space does exactly the same thing. You know, some of the musical changes and, and chord structures that you were listening to are the self same ones that you will see in, in cathedrals and temples all over the world. They're the same ones that you find in crop circles. So, you know, this, these buildings were designed to have that effect on your psyche. You know, anybody who's ever been to ancient Egypt and walked in some of the temples there, they were designed to raise the spirit up to aspire to something, to connect with spirit, to connect with the divine. And it used things like the golden section and the squaring of the circle and all kinds of other things as well in order to do that. And although you won't be, you know, in your mental, rational state of mind, you're not kind of aware of that, somewhere deep inside you are. And that's why we're so affected by these fantastic buildings and by the crop circles when we go into them. And even when we create mandalas for, for ourselves or we draw, like we're going to do in a minute, there, there is a part of you that recognises that and responds to it. And it's something that's really suppressed in our society in this day and age, but something which I think people are now beginning to connect with again on, on this bigger scale. And when you begin to do this, when you begin to look at the fact that um, geometry, number, um, architecture, um, music, all these things are actually connected. It's then when you begin to realise that we are all part of something and connected on a fundamental level. And for, for instance, with the ancient Egyptians, they didn't see um, art, science, da 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 as separate entities. They were all part of the same thing. They were all, all part of a, a single living system which we were part of. Um, and if you want to read a little bit more than uh, more about that, then read a guy called R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz. Has anybody ever heard of him here? Okay, I'm surprised. But um, he, he was a guy, really, really original thinker, and spent a lot of time in, in the early 1900s in Egypt, surveying a lot of the temples over there and analysing their um, reliefs and looking at the number and the geometry involved in it. Um, he kind of went, used that and took it back to recreate the thinking behind. And it is the most, you know, stunning work ever. His big tome is called The Temple of Man um, and is based on the temple at Luxor, which he believed was everything to do with that building was everything the Egyptians knew about man himself and um, his connection to the cosmos. And, um, and I mean, I can't even begin to describe the work, it's, it's absolutely, I don't know what you would call it, iconic, I don't know. But, but you know, we are beginning to reconnect with that in our own way, not, in, not as in, in the past, because I think there's this element that somehow we've got to look to the past to see the future. And I, I think you have to do that a little bit, but not to get stuck in that, oh, the ancients knew everything and we know nothing, because I don't think that's true. Human, human evolution is on, on a trajectory, and now is just the time where we're coming back to that number eight, you know, that periodical renewal that we were talking about, about that resonance with, with the past and bringing it through into the future generations. So here is Crooked Soli, one of my all-time favourite crop circles ever. And as you can see, it's um, part of its symbolism is um, is the DNA helix, but also that that connecting the DNA helix is a holistic kind of thing. And there, I haven't got time to go into it now. Maybe you can ask Jeff about it later. But there are some fantastic numbers in this formation, <laughs> and um, and its depth is absolutely incredible. So I'm I'm just going to leave you with that and and leave you thinking about. You know, the idea that, you know, and we are affected by the world around us using those same 
principles, you know, I mean, if you've ever been in, I don't know, just recently I was in a big hospital and just the feeling of it, I, could, I felt like I was like imploding, you know, from the, you know, the sense of it when you walked inside it compared to something that has been designed with love and care and with sacred geometry where you walk inside and your spirit is lifted up and it's wonderful, you know. And I was saying to somebody earlier, you know, wouldn't it be fantastic if our healing institutions were built using six-fold geometry and five-fold geometry, you know, the numbers of harmony, love and life and healing, you know, and that we cared about bringing what's inside of us and what's outside in the universe into our, our lives and so getting into tune with it, it would be so fantastic. Mm. So, Rory. So here is William Blake's famous painting, The Ancient of Days, and this is a really good place to start with, with our drawing, because for, for a long time, it's, you know, God has often been said to be a geometer, and we talked about, um, you know, the, the golden section as God's phone number or his calling card, and, and in a sense, this picture kind of speaks to that. And, you know, I mean, obviously in the sonic circles, you know, geometry is very important, but just moving that aside gently, this is a, there's a golden thread throughout human civilization that connects to this kind of knowledge, this idea that, you know, there are certain forms that are important and that, you know, create the universe around us and that knowledge of them is, is very, very important for human welfare, both physical and spiritual. And here again, this is a, um, another frontispiece from a, a Bible in the 13th century. This is Christ as a, um, a geometry, uh, as a geometer. And I don't know if you can look just here, but this kind of looks very practical, doesn't it? It looks a bit like Mandelbrot set. And in fact, it was used um, as the first colour illustration in Mandelbrot's book, Fractal Geometry of Nature, um, because he was so, so taken um, by the image. And here's another blade. This is Newton as the divine geometer. And anybody who's done a little bit of research about Newton, you know, he was obviously an instrumental um, physicist for us. But he was absolutely obsessed by alchemy and these ancient ideas of <coughs> geometry being, you know, at the centre of, of um, you know, of human knowledge and a connection somehow between humans and the divine. And here's Voltaire's famous phrase, God is a circle whose centre is everywhere and whose perimeter is nowhere. And this is Sir Bernard of Clairvaux who said, what is God? And uh, upon consideration he said, he is length, width, height and depth, which I think is really cute. And here, this is very, very interesting. This is... Um, Again, a French piece of artwork here. And um, this is geometry um, personified as an elegant woman. And in ancient times, um, geometers kind of had a, um, kind of like a muse, if you like. And her name was Sophia. And um, Sophia means wisdom. And, um, and here she is, Sophia, wisdom, shown as a geometer. And, and in a sense, geometry, like many other things, kind of has had different... Um, um, factions to it, if you like, and, um, or aspects would be a better word. And in a sense, the feminine part of geometry is that sort of um, um, intuitive, creative side of geometry, and its male component is the, the physical side of creating things and drawing geometry. So there is kind of that masculine and feminine side, not, not to put that in definitive characteristics, but but in that sort of sense, there, there is that aspect to it. Yeah. So when geometry is applied in the world of matter, it reveals its masculine aspect. And this is really important, you know, I mean, some of 
what we've been trying to do this weekend is, you know, to, to give you the idea that geometry and shape and these things take us beyond the veil of ordinary reality and they allow us to move aside that metaphorical veil and to, to glimpse, you know, the, the other side, to glimpse the, the organising principle behind all of creation. You should have in front of you a drawing board, a piece of paper, a bulldog clip, a ruler, a pencil and a compass and an eraser. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. There are a few um, pencil sharpeners around, so we're just going to have to share those around. So there should be one every table or so, so if anybody needs one, <coughs> just shout out. Okay, we're going to be working on the paper in a, um, in a landscape format, so in the wide format. And um, just the bulldog clip there is just to keep the paper on the board, to stop it from slipping when we're working. And it's kind of, it's just really important to feel nice and relaxed, to feel like this is going to be a little bit of fun. But it's, it's, it's a big deal on one level, but it's not a big deal on another. And, you know, this is supposed to be enjoyable, you're supposed to get something from it, rather than feeling pressured and so on and so on. So, as we go through some of this, if anybody has any difficulty with anything, I'm just going to... You know, just shout out and I'll come and give you a hand. It's, um, you know, that's kind of part of what I'm here for. So, okay. Right, so. I've always thought, I mean, obviously, you know, we're living in the 21st century. A lot of people draw on computers these days and they are an absolutely fantastic tool when it comes to looking at the geometry of formations and, and creating an accurate silhouette. But there is an importance to drawing by hand, and that is your own personal connection, physical connection, with the <coughs> geometry itself. And, um, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, the circle representing the divine, and just being able to hold that in your mind when you draw is, you know, it's a, it's a really good experience to do, to actually be able to think about what it is you're doing, what it is you're reenacting. Re and geometry at its best is a kind of a meditative experience. And one of the best experiences that I have when <coughs> I'm drawing some of the circles is kind of just getting lost in the shape. And some of them are very kind of um, hypnotic and rhythmic. You know, they sometimes it is a repetition of something moving around the circle, so you get a feel of kind of timing, of rhythm, of shape. It's kind of like a dance on paper. And it's very, very difficult to put into words when, when you, you've kind of not experienced that for yourself. And, and it is one of the delights of drawing the prop circles, because I feel when I've drawn a circle that I, I feel like I know it a little bit. You know, to look at it is one thing, and you know, we can look at it, we can appreciate it, we can, take the shapes apart, we can put them back together, but there is something really intimate and personal about actually drawing these things by hand. So, you know, here it's just basically what I've said. So drawing by hand allows you to feel the shape, form and rhythm, movement and of the pattern in an experiential way. It allows you to connect intuitively with the shape as well and it allows you to feel it. And I, you know, um, we were talking about the ancient Egyptians a moment ago. Shwala Dalubit said that the Egyptian philosophy, they called it the intelligence of the heart because they, um, that was right, they thought with their heart and felt with their mind. Mm -hmm. and, and in a sense, that's kind of really important to the, the whole geometry thing, you know, is, is to be able to, you know, um, to feel something as well as to kind of think it as well, to, to sort of do it in reverse to the way that, that we would now. So it provides the opportunity to explore the various components, numbers and proportions. So when you're actually building up a prop circle on the page, you can see the way that the different geometries fit together. So like the one we were looking at before where there was the five and the six together, you know, you, unless you actually sat down and, and did the drawing, you, it's not something you would just see by looking at a photograph. It, yes, provides the opportunity to see the patterns fit together. It gives a good sense of the complexity of the design. I mean, some of the feedback, the, 
the vast majority of the feedback I get from people who try this is, I didn't realise it was so hard. And, um, and, and it really gives you then an appreciation of the circle maker's art. You know, because I mean, it's some sometimes they're hard enough to work out on paper. Never mind trying to do it in in a field in the dark. <laughs> and it also allows for that exploration of the philosophy of sacred geometry. So, you know, that going back and reminding yourself about the the qualities of five, six, seven, and then looking at those qualities and perhaps a formation might bring together three, one, and four. And so looking at the, the, the qualities of those of the numbers, so one would be the unity and um, the idea of encompassing something, keeping it together, um, showing it as a unity as well as the diversity inside it, um, then you would be looking at four of the, the material world of matter, or mother substance is another really nice word for it, and then five, the geometry of life of all living things geometry of six, of, of perfect love. Six is one of the so-called perfect numbers because mm. perfect numbers are those which are divisible by its own <coughs> lesser numbers. So, um, so with six, you know, it, it, you, can, you have one, two, um, and three, and then those all work together to create six. So it's one of the few numbers that actually does that. So that's why it's known as one of the perfect numbers. So, and then six also has its aspect as best economy, which is about the love of resources, the love of the environment, and, and those kinds of things. So the, you know, the way that these things are put to, John Michel was so good at this, you know, at, at the way that things kind of click together, the different numbers. But it's only kind of by learning to do these kind of exercises and then taking them into to drawing some of them and maybe drawing your own. I mean, you know, the idea of drawing your own mandala, you know, of putting together the numbers that mean most to you and finding a beautiful way for that to happen. There, I mean, there have been some fantastic crop circles, one of which had, um, I think it was 7, 11 and 13 in it, you know, and... Um, and, and lots and lots of different things sort of coming together. So, you know, this, you know, by doing this, you're beginning to learn the language and to kind of integrate it into yourself and in, into your life. And kind of, you know, this is what's so nice about this weekend because I think when you sit down to do geometry, you do need a space where you're not going to be disturbed, you know, it's no good if you've got the kids running up and down the stairs and, you know, you're being interrupted every five minutes. And so create the space and time to, to do your drawing practice. It, it's something that can't be hurried, it needs a quiet, calm atmosphere to work, which we've got today, which is fantastic. And, um, yeah, and so drawing the sacred geometry, you know, some of the, the basic things like the vesica and drawing the square coming from the vesicle, but there, it's a sacred act. You are, in a sense, reenacting um, parts of creation itself, and, and you become part of that, and it is a, very much a sacred act. <coughs> okay, so this is your drawing equipment, as you've got, got it today. So just get your compasses out and have a look at them. Just, um, just familiarize yourself with them. Um, Every day you hear that line, just get your compasses out. Just get your compasses yeah. out. <laughs> and um, if you're going to do this yourself at home at any point, you're probably going to need a bigger compass than the one we're working with today. Um, you can get, get bigger ones. Um, you can get them off Amazon, Helix, and maybe you can make a bigger one as well. Always try and use a compass with a thumb wheel. And I say that because this is the, the thumb wheel is at the top there. It's just really good for accuracy and it stops the compass kind of moving in and out which can happen with, with some of the sort of more basic ones. So one with a thumb wheel is really, really important. Just make sure that looking at your compass that um, at the bottom you'll see there's a, a bit of a blue bit, a plastic bit at the bottom. Just make sure they're straight because sometimes they, they are designed to bend in sometimes. So just make sure yours is straight because it needs to be straight for today. And um, if it's not, just bend it into shape and just tighten up the little <coughs> wheels. Now, the other thing you've got is um, a straight edge. In our case, we've got a ruler. 
but any straight edge will do. The, the wonderful thing about classic geometry is that there is no measurement at all. So we're not dealing in centimetres, inches, or anything like that. It just relies purely on ratio to do it. Now, obviously, with some of the crop circles, because they're not sacred geometry in the classical sense, they do require some measuring. And um, one of the most important things that you can do is actually go and, and take a few measurements <coughs> out in the field so that you can work on them back at home. But some of them, some of the circles you can just draw without even measuring because, you know, the geometry is very pure in some of them. So, so it's just a straight edge, not a ruler. Um, a sharp pencil is good. Um, a cutting board, or um, this is actually backing board for framing. And it's just because the, the end of the compass is really sharp and you don't want it going through the paper and scratching your best table or anything like that. And it also it helps it stay put where, where you um, want it to. Um, obviously you need a razor, heavy paper, heavy paper, again because if you work with really flimsy paper, by the time you've drawn lots of things on there, you're ripping holes into the paper and everything, which is no good. Good light, spectacles if you use them. And um, if you, again, if you're going to draw some of these up into artworks or whatever, you need a compass that has a pen attachment. And <coughs> That usually means that one of these legs comes off and you put another one on and it has a little thing in there that you put the pen in and tighten it on. And then you can work it in, which is more permanent than the pencil. So, there we go. That's the basics for that. Here's your equipment as you should have it. <coughs> Everybody happy with that so far? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, the last thing to check is the pencil lead on your compass just to make sure that it's actually poking down far enough. Ideally, the, the metal part and, and the pencil lead should be in balance, should be the same. If anybody's isn't, if they need to move it down because it's, um, you know, being worn down or whatever, just let me know and we can do that. Did we find a pin, by the way? Okay. So, we're going to establish the point, and um, in order to do that, we're going to find the centre of, of the paper. And again, just to reiterate what we were saying before, that this point is kind of, in our 3D world, this point exists as a, a, a point on paper, but in the, in the world of forms and archetypes, that this that the geometer's point has no dimension at all. It kind of just, the whole of the universe is kind of, um, created around it. And here are just some just some little phrases that are going to be really useful to you. This one is diameter, which is um, the widest part across the circle. And radius, which is the distance from the center point to the perimeter of the circle. So center and perimeter. Okay, so we're going to begin by drawing a circle. So just establish the point wherever you want to on the paper to start off with, anywhere you like, just approximately in the beginning. Put the, the, um, the, the needle point of the compass somewhere, and I just want you to draw your first circle. You can have the compass as wide as you like. It, you know, just kind of keep it fairly wide, sort of like this. It's much easier to work with, um, you, you use, you turn the thumb wheel to make it smaller or larger, so don't, don't force the compasses, just use the thumb wheel to make it wider. And when you've got your first circle, just where you can see on the paper that you've made the pin print, just mark that point with your pencil so that you can see it. So we're going to do this again on the page, and what I want you to do is to put your pin in the paper somewhere else and see how far you get just turning the compass with one hand to see how far you can turn it. Yeah, just see if you can turn it the whole 360 degrees, just one hand, turn it nice and steady. Anywhere in the circle? Anywhere, it doesn't matter, anywhere on the paper is fine. 
So it's just the kind of getting <coughs> the feel of the compass turning in your hand. Brilliant. Brilliant. So that that is something that you you know that you can practice over and over again. And the more you practice that, the better your control of the compass is. So it's a um, really good exercise just to sort of, and it's also a good loosening up exercise as well when you're starting to draw, is just to turn a few circles just to sort of get the wrist and the fingers going. The next thing that you need to do is put your um, pinpoint on the perimeter of a circle that you've drawn and then draw another one. And this again gives you a feeling for creating accuracy where you've got to put the pin on a particular place. So just put it anywhere on the perimeter, get it on the perimeter and just turn a few circles. You can do it at several points around the circle. Just get used to the feel of placing the compass on the paper on a point and then just turning it around. And if you like, you can try altering the um, the you know the angle of the compass, you know, make some smaller circles, make some larger circles. Just get kind of just get the feel of it, start to feel that you're feeling a little bit familiar with it and that it isn't your enemy, it is actually your friend. <laughs> it isn't something that you have to do battle with. And, and kind of get used to the pressure as well because you know, you've got to kind of get a medium pressure with it. You can, you know, if you're too light, it's very hard to see what you've done. And if you're too heavy, you know, you're pressing the compass right in, you're pressing the lead in. So it's important to kind of get the, just a nice feel so that you can see what you've drawn. You're not pressing too hard and you're not being too light either. So, fantastic. So I'm, I'm kind of wondering how that feels. I mean, how does that does that feel okay? Yeah. Or mm, yeah. yeah, we're happy with that. We're feeling good. Yeah. Super. Yeah. We make geometry ninjas of you yet. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, when when you do this at home, you the the other thing that's really nice is to sort of start colouring in the various sort of bits as well, you know, where the bits where they intersect, the bits on the outside and, and so on. Now one thing you're going to notice from what you've drawn is that um, that there is kind of no space between the shapes so that they sort of flow into to one another. And what we were saying earlier about the crop circles always observing that rule of hospitality where there's that space between the shapes means that when we actually draw crop circles properly, we essentially have to draw them twice because there needs to be two lines um, for each. So for the circle, where, where we have a ring of flattened crop, for instance, and we're, we're replicating that on paper, we actually create two circles, one slightly smaller than the other, to create that band of, of flattened crop. So, so very often when you're drawing them, you find that you, you draw the shape and then you're having to draw them again to create the uh, to create the flattened bands of, of the shape. But we'll, we'll look at this a little bit more later. Okay, so I want you to turn your paper over when you feel happy. <coughs> Just take a few deep breaths, always good when drawing. is really nice and the other the other word that is really nice is encompass Amen. you know this this idea of putting something in a unity surrounding it in, putting it within within this sort of unified so it's always such a, a good word so we're going to find the center of the page now we're going to measure this out just because it's easier to do it this way there are essentially two ways to find the center of your paper one of them is to measure like we're going to do today, but the other one, if your straight edge is long enough, which ours isn't today, is just to create a cross diagonally 
from one corner and then the other corner where they intersect crookedly is the centre of the page. <coughs> but here we're just going to measure, with not, you know, this is, you know, easy, this is first step. So um, horizontally you're going to need to make a very, very, just a very light mark at 15 centimetres. Very light mark, because you're going to have another one in a minute. And then you're going to move horizontally down 10.5 centimetres and, and line it up with the original mark that you just made. So line it up with the mark that you just made and then measure 10.5 centimetres and that is your centre point. Okay? <coughs> and if you just make that mark a little bit heavier, get rid of the other one, you know now where the centre of the page is. Is 10.5 centimetres. <laughs> well, I, I love inches because it's old world and it uses um, units of 12 and it's all wonderful, but it's, um, this is just slightly easier to do on this page. Than centimetres. Okay, so we're Before we start getting into sort of like 9 and 3 8 inches or something, which I, I find confusing. So. Okay. So, now that we have created that point, we have essentially <coughs> centred ourselves, which is, you know, a really good place to, to sort of stop and think, right, <coughs> this is now, I'm now in the centre, I'm now balanced, I'm feeling okay, now, now we can go and create our geometric form. And so, there we go, we've centred ourselves. So today I thought we would explore six-fold geometry just because we've got some novices with us and some more experienced people. So we'll, we will start off with the novice stuff and then hopefully we'll be able to take you through something a, a little bit more interesting as, as we go on. So this formation that you can see in the background is the classical flower of life. Anybody, I mean I'm sure most of you have heard of the flower of life system, yeah? Anybody not heard of it? Okay. Um, it is essentially a geometry system that shows how six-fold geometry can be a seed geometry for creating so much more. I think the guy, is it um, John Below McCusadek? John Below Yeah, um, invented the system. He says that this is kind of like, um, not this is the seed of life, the flower of life is a little bit bigger than this. I think you were drawing it earlier, weren't you, Anna, that sort of it's more 12-fold geometry. I actually think that the geometry of life is five-fold geometry because it's that that animates life. It's that that separates life, life out from all other geometry. Um, to me, six-fold geometry is more, more about harmony, perfection, uh, also about relationships because there's this lovely thing about um, it being one of the perfect numbers. Um, and also this idea of best economy. So in a sense, six is a really good place to start learning geometry. And here are just some formations here that use some of this. This is um, Winterbourne Bassett, 2010. Absolutely gorgeous. You've got the six petals going all the, the way around there. Absolute beautiful classic geometry. Fantastic. And can you see, I've just got to point this out because it's so pretty, can you see just this little ring here? Okay. There were rings of little swirls going all the way around to create this ring in the centre. It's absolutely beautiful. And here's another one. This is something more, as you can see, more complicated, but again based on six-fold geometry. Very, very beautiful. And another. Did you go in this one? <coughs> Which one was that? The from 2012? No, 2010. Oh yeah. no, yeah. no, I didn't. This one here. Did you go in this one? No, I didn't. Yeah. I didn't get that one either. This is beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. Can you see how they don't quite link up the arms? So it's kind of like almost like a windmill sort of going around. You kind of want to spin that around. A cube kind of popping out of that one. Yeah, here you go. Yeah, this is from Mill Hill 2005. 
this is a hexagon rather than the, the flower and you can see some, here you can see you know the relationship between six and three because you've got the triangles going <coughs> on as well. It seems to be almost another dimension involved in that. Yeah. Kind of it's, it's coming up, sort of yeah, yeah. raised up around. Yeah. Yeah. This is um, Cheryl 2005. This is a, a hexagon of hexagons. Mm. <coughs> oh, this was just gorgeous as well. 2011. Can you see the way that the crop is weaved around the outside mm. here? So the two primary um, shapes involved in six-fold geometry are the hexagon, which has six equal sides and angles of 120 <coughs> degrees. And angles in um, these geometric forms become really, really interesting, and we'll talk a little bit about them later because very many of them are linked to um, periods of time, which is another dimension. <laughs> and so we've got the hexagon and then the hexagram. So here's the hexagram, and again you can see that relationship between 6 and 3 because we've got two, essentially two overlapping triangles here which creates the seal of Solomon. And, um, and this is interesting, you know, if, again if you've watched the Da Vinci Code, I'm sure some of you have, um, um, what's the character's name, Do um, Professor Langdon talks about um, the, the up pointed triangle as the, the, the masculine and the down pointed triangle as the feminine. But actually in Jewish culture, um, this was always shown over the door of the temple and it was um, about God and the spirit moving upwards and then downwards is um, man and earthly matter. So again it was that marriage between the spirit and, and the earth. So very, very interesting. So here we are, the hexagram, two triangles, Internal angles of the hexagon, we've already talked about, 120 each times 6 is 720, which gives you that sort of magical 72 number, one, one degree of precession, which we'll, we'll talk about in a little while. Then internal angles of 6 triangles, 60 times 18, or 180 times 6, which is 1080, which is another one of those beautiful magical numbers. <laughs> And here again, you know, just to reiterate, six, the number of best economy, that little story about the, the honeybees using, getting the most amount of storage space using the least amount of, um, of materials or wax. And you, you see this pattern all over the show. If you've ever been in places where they've had a wine rack, that, you know, hexagons all moved together, or whether it's, um, you know, you've seen it on the ground as bricks for tiling, all kinds of things, you see it all the time. Six fits very, very beautifully together with no spaces. So the molecular structure of water when frozen produces six-fold geometry as well. This is a snowflake. All snowflakes are six-fold geometry. It is, yeah, it's in its kind of molecular structure. And uh, snowflakes kind of um, produce an inordinate variety of everything. You know, so, you know, people often say about the crop circles, you know, well, you know, they're all different, they don't seem, you know, to mean anything, but there's something about that holds them together in their DNA that, that relates them through their geometry. <coughs> Here's basalt col columns, which are also um, roughly hexagonal. Again, you can see how when nature reproduces these shapes, it's never perfect. It's always kind of an approximation of. Um, but again, you know, you're talking about crystalline structures also being six-fold. You know, you look at a lot of quartz crystals, for instance, they have six sides to them. Many others do as well. So here's the perfect number. A perfect number is a number which is the sum of all its divisors. So you can divide six by three, two, or one, and then one, two, and three equals six. And these are just some of the other perfect numbers there. But there are not too many of them. But um, lovely, lovely bit of maths magic. And that there were six days of creation. So these numbers are kind of weaved into our myths and legends. And, and these myths and legends were 
originally used to kind of make sure that this knowledge moves through the generations. We kind of think of myths now as just kind of cute stories that you tell people. But originally they were there to make sure, that, you know, through an oral tradition, that these numbers were, you know, understood and they were revered and through hearing the stories it would remind people what they meant. Seven is the day of rest, seven is the spirit number, so... Tarot preserves six as the number of love. And here is the flower of life, which you can see at the centre, there's the six, the seed of life, and then it moves out in all directions. There's the seed of life. So have a, pick up your pencil and have a look at that, because that also has six sides. But as most pencils do, so there you are, you're looking at something which is harmonious and beautiful and you should definitely fall in love with it. <laughs> so here it is, look, most places have seen an old best economy of shape for grip by the human hand. And even what is inside your pencil, your lead, <coughs> the, um, the graphite, is also has a hexagonal structure, so even as you're going to be drawing six-fold geometry today, you're actually going to be putting these wonderful hexagonal little marks on your page every time the pencil goes over the page, which I just think is really, mm, really good. So if numbers have principles or meanings, then these principles can be read or interpreted as a language. And we can reconnect function and meaning together. Meaning can be imbued in pattern and symmetry. And the crop circles can be understood via geometry and gesture. And <coughs> hopefully, we'll, you know, when we get drawing some of these, you'll, you'll get to at least feel a little bit of that. Okay, so the first thing to do when learning about six-fold geometry is to learn how to divide the circle into six. Now, Every circle is divided into 360 degrees. So we're going to start by drawing a circle with a radius of 5 centimetres. So you need to open your compass to 5 centimetres. Use your ruler for this. This is the measuring is to make sure that the pattern fits on the page and you're not kind of going to go off at the edge or whatever, which would be a disaster. So. So when you've got your compass open at 5 centimetres, you can place the pin on your centre point and draw the circle in. And then just as you, you, know, you draw the circle, just you know, relax, take a breath, get a little feel for it. I think it's really interesting and sometimes when I'm drawing the circles and I feel a little bit uptight, I kind of feel like there's a drag or a resistance sort of in, in, in the compass on, on the paper when I'm moving it around and then I think, okay, a few more deep breaths, you know, then go back to it. And sometimes I, I can get, you know, I'll, I'll sort of be getting a major part way through it and I get really excited, oh yeah, I'm getting it, you know, and you know, by the time I've rubbed it out several times and drawn a few more in, you know, I think, oh yeah, I'm really getting it, and then I have to kind of like, okay, just need to calm down to finish this last bit. Okay, are we all happy with that? Yep. Yep, brilliant. We're now going to put the pencil um, lead on the centre and the compass pointer A. Now it doesn't matter, it's just at the top of the circle somewhere. It doesn't need measuring, just anywhere will do. So put the pencil lead on the centre this time, not the, not the, not the pin. And um, put the compass point at A, just at the top of the circle, on the perimeter of the circle. And then you can swing a line in. Just swing it from the centre, crossing the centre point from one side of the circle to the other. Are we happy? Yeah. Brilliant. 
So from one point on uh, where you're, um, so here we go, we've drawn this one in here, okay, and using this point here, you're then going to swing another arc in, okay? <coughs> and this is, um, this is kind of, it's a way of walking around the circle using the compass. It's kind of really, really neat exercise. And again, just watch where you're placing the compass. Don't put too much pressure on yourself, but try and keep it as accurate as you can as you're, as you're working. And just take your time. Okay. And then we're going to move to the next step. and then we swing this arc in here through the centre of the point. Where am I to put my the point? Sorry, I missed the... That's alright. We put <coughs> that one in first. Yeah. Then this one. Yeah. And it's here at this point. Right, so you always go to A. Yeah. Well, yes, you always go to where you drew it last. Okay. And then pop the next one in. Thank you. And then you keep walking around. Put the next one in. Again, when I'm warming up to do drawings, this is, you know, one of the sort of staple exercises just to sort of practice getting the accuracy in. Again, being steady, breathing deeply, just concentrating but not putting too much pressure on yourself to do it. Would it have anything to do with the distance that you're changing? No, um, no, it is literally the, the um, just the way that you won't quite have put the, the, the compass point on the right at the where it needs to be on. So you slip as you go around. Yeah. It is it's really hard. Really, really more difficult than you can imagine. And then that's the final one there. So if you if you were to put a story on that, a story, <coughs> yeah, or you know, or a meaning, like right? In the um, sense of what have we been doing? We have been. Could, could you tell the story? Of? Okay. Well, when I when I draw this, I am to me this is the flower of love, and um, it's a beautiful kind of flower. It's um, it's creating that sort of perfect harmony, if you like. And also, because there's no measurement involved, there's no changing of the, the diameter of the, of the compass at all, the, the angle of the compass, it's all about making something beautiful with a kind of economy. So again, it's those principles of six coming into it, you know, of, of best economy, creating something out of the least amount of materials in the easiest possible way. Just like nature does, really. You're, you're kind of recreating that principle of nature. Okay, so there's the flower. And there is the flower of life as a crop circle there, Buckland in Oxfordshire, 2008. Okay. I'm not going to do this today. But this was a, a formation from 2012, the 12 petal flower. Mm -hmm. There it is in the landscape. Okay, now, the next thing I'd like you to do is to look at the petals. Let's just have a go back a little. And you're going to need the straight edge now, and you're just going to connect each petal. So draw a line from here to here, here to here, and so on. And when you've done
done that, you would have created a hexagon. every other point. So you're going to draw a straight line from here to here, here to here, and here to here to create one triangle, and then connect the others to create the other triangle to draw your hexagram or your seal song. Sorry, Karen, can you say that again? Yeah, connect every other other point. So from here to here, to here, oh, to make the to make the triangle. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah. 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 And, um, and, you know, take it away with you and sort of have a play with it. You know, it's, it's really good to sort of colour it in, colour the bits in, and maybe have several different ones where you can highlight different parts of things. But it's kind of, you know, really interesting to kind of see what comes up with that. So I'm going to pass some more paper out now, and we're going to do something else. So, so what did you call that last one? The sea of sorry, sea, you called it the sea of something. Sea of Solomon. Sea of Solomon. Yeah. Do you want to pass those around that? Bit? That'd be So we're going to do another really nice exercise here for six-fold geometry because <coughs> when you actually come to sort of drawing any shape, yeah. you don't want to have to be drawing things into the picture that don't actually need to be there. So we, we drew the, the seed of life there, the flag, and that essentially divides the circle into six equal parts. But we don't want to be sort of drawing a flower of life into every drawing we do where what we actually need to do is just divide the perimeter of the circle by six. So what we're going to do is go through that exercise again, but you're just going to mark the perimeter this time where you would have draw the arcs in, you're just going to nick the perimeter with the pencil and you're going to walk the compass around the edge of the circle. So, go, go right back. Just mark it with your pencil to create the centre point. 
literally around so we're not the drawing the arc don't draw the so arc in just okay. nick the perimeter on each side right. this is just to help you see where to put the compass and you're literally just walking it around walking it around the circle Just working your way around the circle. I got lost one back because I drew the ask. So I'm, I'm <laughs> not okay, sure let's where go, I'm let's supposed go to go meet. Okay, so okay, there you so go. Okay, so point of the compass goes. At, um, sorry. Yeah, the point of the compass goes at A. Yeah. Yeah. And then you just, instead of drawing the arc in, you're just going to nick it at C and B. So you're just going to, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, so you're just going to swing it spot. at the two points where the compass naturally goes through the point. Some of you in the room are getting a feel for this already, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want me to draw the arc now or just nicking the perimeter? No, just nicking the perimeter. Yeah. So it's just literally walking the compass round the perimeter just to mark the points. Thank you. Yeah. And, I, and as I was saying before, it's because sometimes when you actually, you're going to draw a circle, and say you just want to draw the hexagon in where you would connect all the points, you don't want to be drawing all the arcs in the centre circle. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's good for the first time that you try it to, to put the arcs in because you can see how it works. But then when we're moving on to the next step, we're just literally making the perimeter so that we're dividing it into the six equal parts. Here's the next one. Are we 
Put those petals in now. No, no, don't put the petals in. Just we're just literally nicking. Okay, right, right, sorry. Yeah, yeah. nicking the perimeter so that we can divide it. Right, just more than the There's the penultimate one. So there you can see mm -hmm. how you would finish up there, and you've got you just divided the circle by six. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. <coughs> Here is just some other bits and pieces for you to look at for a minute. So there's the the seal of Solomon and the two triangles. Here are some tiling based on the hexagram rather than the hexagon. And again, that still works really nicely together. And then here is, um, this is um, one plane in 2012. This, you know, you can see the seal of Solomon at work there inside this crop circle. <coughs> then you can see the, the hexagram at the centre there, and you can see how there is another shape that comes up with six-fold geometry a lot, which is the diamond shape. Mm -hmm. yeah. And here is a, a really cute formation. This was at Silvery Hill in 2011, and this is sort of six circles all going into one. And um, I decided that I wanted to do something other than just drawing it, so I decided that I was going to make it out of circles and then fit them all together. And, um, and this is kind of the basic pattern here. So again, I think sometimes doing these things is really helpful because they kind of give you a feel of how some of the shapes put together. So I'm going to pass some circles around to you. And you'll need six of them each and then just pass them, pass them around. And in a way, this is, this is such a great shape, the way this works, because it's almost like um, like the shutter on a camera, an old fashioned camera with the shutter where it kind of all rotates into shape. So this is kind of, an, you know, this is again another way of um, six manifesting itself. This time is six circles, equidistant circles, all sort of nested into one another. Just to keep going back and having a go at it, because it, you know, once you learn that skill of walking around and you improve your accuracy, it's really, really useful. So, turn the paper over now, folks. You're going to start by putting the compass pencil on the centre point. Um, no, the compass pencil, the yeah. lead, is it's at the centre point. And the, and the point of the book. Yes, so that's right. Exactly. And the, the reason I like doing this is because yeah, it gets away from the fact that, you know, the compass Just point over half is always at the centre yeah. of what you do, and it isn't. So this is kind of the other way around, is what I like about doing this next. <laughs> yeah, the centre is everywhere, yeah. So... So they're more than semicircles, right? Um, you, the first one is um, loose, but this one goes until it meets the perimeter of that first one that you draw. Yeah? Will it go from perimeter to perimeter? To the perimeter. So the compass point is in the center. The compass point is in the center again. So the compass lead. Yeah, the compass lead, the pencil part, is in the center. The lead goes back in the center, sorry. And this is the bit I've not explained well. And then the point goes on the perimeter of that previous one then draw the eye. This is really counterintuitive, and that's what the circle makers seem to be really good at. Sometimes they present us with, you know, very classical geometry, everything's around the centre, and so on, and then they sort of give us something like this, and although it, it kind of looks really simple, um, that there's something really counterintuitive about the way that it's drawn, and, and I think it's incredibly beautiful. Yeah. Can I ask a question about yeah. exercise? Yeah. The starting step. You, get, yeah. you draw a circle 
You don't oh, draw no, an entire no, circle. No, okay. You put you put the compass um, lead in ah, the centre, no. okay. no, and no, then no. the point no, at no, sort no. of ninety degrees up. Okay. And then draw the first one in as a partial, um, yeah. partial yeah. circle, maybe a semicircle, maybe okay. just a little bit. No, no. And you have to go and finish just, that one off at the end by connecting it on the final one. Lead back to the centre. Yeah, and then put the point on the perimeter of the circle. So this is one of actually one of my all-time favourite crop circles, and uh, this was at Milk Hill in August 2012, and I called it the Milk Hill Rose because of this beautiful um, pattern in the centre. So what we're going to have a go at doing now is actually just the basics of this um, central rose, because again this is um, just really really nice six-fold geometry, and again another expression of the way. Um, we can use um, circular geometry in six to make these fantastic patterns. So, hey. we're going to need some more paper, I think. <laughs> so, um, we're going to have a go at drawing the basic geometry of this. This is just a close up from the painting I, I did of this formation. Just to give this is the, the bit that we're going to have a go at. It is quite difficult if you're a beginner, so don't beat yourself up about this one if, if somehow it's not clicking with you. Um, but hopefully we'll, we'll get you through it to the end. So, you're going to find the centre of the paper again. So, 15 in the um, horizontal, 10.5 in the vertical. And this time you're going to open your compasses to just 2 centimetres. Now, one of the things that you'll notice when you start doing um, any kind of geometry work on a regular basis is that the smaller you um, have to make the circles, the harder they are to draw. And I know for some of some of the paintings I've done, I've had to for some of the really small circles, I've had to go to using a um, a, um, a stencil and just putting the lines in and then putting the stencil on the top. Of it. So. It is quite difficult to draw when they're small. Hopefully this one isn't too small though, so. So you're going to open your compass to two centimetres and you're going to draw your first circle in the centre. Drawing and I'm coming up against something difficult. I think, oh, now I realise why I don't want to be God. Not <laughs> 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 You know, we were talking about um, earlier about the Vesica Pisces, that lovely almond shape in the, the middle of the two circles. Well, the door here and the window, yeah. at the top of the door, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. the Vesica. Yeah. So, yeah. And which makes sense because the vesica is a doorway or a window into other worlds. So it's you know it was used in you know the design of doors and windows in churches with exactly that idea in mind. Okay. Hmm. to need to do that exercise that we practiced earlier about walking the compass around the circle. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> yep, do we remember that? Yes. Are we remembering that? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's the lead yeah. in the middle. And then in the middle of the middle. Yeah, and then swing don't draw the don't draw the arc in, but yeah. just mark where it would mm -hmm. And as I say, you, you'll find that working at this smaller scale makes it so much more difficult. <laughs> but we have to walk, um, work at this scale just so that the pattern that we're going to draw fits on the paper that we've got. So. 
And it's so, you know, folks, it's okay if the compass is slipping to hold both ends of it at the bottom. You know, so hold the, the point with one hand and then swing the lead round with the other if that works best for you. So I just think this is like Circle Makers School of Geometry 101, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. totally. Did they ever really decide like who's coming to make them? No, it's a totally open-ended question and there are, there are as many theories as there are questions about mm -hmm. it. And, I mean, we could. I mean, we could literally spend days talking about it. I mean, hopefully we will before we get to the end of the entire weekend. We'll have a little chat about, you know, some ideas and maybe some ideas you have. But my own approach to it is just to remain as open as possible and actually to take my understanding of the circle makers through the gesture of what they do. You know, so we were, we're talking about how all the quintuplets square the circle. You know, and how phi is often, or the golden section is often used in crop circle design. And the way that, you know, a lot of the circles are really balanced with their use of numbers and proportions. And that kind of tells me something about whoever makes them. And that's kind of where I draw my inferences from, because I think the rest is really totally unknown. It's, you know, totally unknown. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a... And it can be, you know, to use a very, very bad pun, it can be a circular argument. And, you know, it, and it, it, you know, you go through processes, I think, once you get yourself involved in this. I mean, you know, you, every, everybody reaches the point where they reach the crossroads, where there is, do I believe that there's something more to this than people making it? Everybody gets to that crossroads. And if you're lucky, you get to that crossroads more than once, but on a, on a slightly different level. And, it, you know, it's something... You, because there isn't an, an answer to it, it's something that you kind of struggle with. You know, it's like, and it's like many other questions, you know, you're, you're essentially interfacing with the unknown. You know, and it's like for many, many years people have tried to make sense of the UFO phenomenon, you know, and you'll have some UFO researchers who'll say, yes, they're um, technological alien spacecraft and there are... Um, extraterrestrial biological entities on board and they come from deep space and so on. And you get other UFO researchers who will say, um, no, they come from other dimensions and some of them are not physical and, um, you know, and the way that UFOs behave, how they pop in, pop out, or some of them seem more like plasmas than actual physical, technical craft. So, you know, we're talking about bumping up face to face with something that, to me, it's, you know, beyond, um, at the moment, beyond explanation. And we may be dealing with things that we really don't, at the moment, have the ability to comprehend. I'm quite open to that. I mean, I am sure, I am sure that there have been circles that have been made by people. You know, I'm sure somebody must have gone out there and tried their hand at it. I'm, I'm sure that must go on. And, and, you know, there are some people out there who make designs in crops for advertising and things like that. But... <coughs> Those things are always done in broad daylight, they're always well lit, they have as long as they like, and you know, nobody bothers them, they just get on and do it. Like, but I think, you know, under pressure of time at night, you know, where you might get caught, you know, those are totally different kind of experiences to, you know, be doing your geometry in, you know. It's like here it's nice and relaxed, everybody's warm and comfortable and you know, you've got all your equipment to hand and, and everything like that. But I can't imagine what it would be like to sort of go out in the freezing cold and to be worried about whether I was going to be caught by the arm and making something that was 200 feet in diameter, worrying that was I going to make a mistake. You know, I mean, all those things sort of come into play. And I, I mean, I do think it would be terrifically difficult to do that. What, you mean you haven't been tempted to try it? I have tried it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, of course I have. I wanted to know what could be done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the, in the little formation that we made, even I managed to screw the geometry up. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, I wouldn't like to think, and it was about 100, no, it wasn't even that, maybe, yeah, about 50 feet in diameter, I think it was. So, it, I mean, very small crop circle wise. What really. shape did you do? Uh, a quintuplet. And just getting those four circles into the correct 
90 degree. It was hard. Mm. Messed it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got our circle divided into six. You're now going to open your compasses to four centimeters, which is the listen folks, that is the diameter of the circle that you've already drawn. Okay? The diameter of the circle you've already drawn. So you're basically opening your compasses out to the widest point of the circle that you've just drawn. Can you just use centimeters. two of the marks that are off each other now? Hang on, just, yeah. Yeah. just open, open use your, you measure it out using your ruler to open the compasses to four centimetres wide. But the, the night, what I'm trying to get at here is that you're essentially dealing with now something that is twice the size of the original. Yeah. So you, you've drawn your first circle, which was opening the compass to two centimetres, which means the diameter of that was four centimetres. Yeah. The radius of the next bit is, is now going to be four centimetres, so you've got that kind of doubling going on. Okay. Now, here we go. <laughs> so we're using very, very similar principles to the one that we've just drawn, but we're going to be drawing it this time around the central circle. So you're going to put um, the compass point here at A and the lead on B, and then we're going to draw an arc. <coughs> just about as far around as that. Just estimate. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. Just draw around to around about here. Yeah. <coughs> and rinse and repeat. Yeah. Just give everybody a minute just to do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the other thing that gets me about prop silvers is the mind of whoever it is that creates them, because they are just so fantastic, and the, you know the way that they fit together is just amazing. You think the mind that does that, you know, is is fairly wonderful. Are we happy with that, folks? Okay. And again, you're gonna you're gonna walk your way around the center. Again, keep the compass at the white at the, the length, and the same as we were saying before, you put the the compass leg here, and then the um, the other point on the perimeter of the previous circle, and work your way around. Work. Sorry, hang on a minute. Yeah. Hang on, folks. You you're working with the opposite one. Can you see? So like you did with the first one, where you use these two points here, for the next one you're going to use the opposite ones. Yeah. Where did you put your central point? Again, you're going to no, 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 no. You're going to use Hopefully you get an idea with that, that you're working on very similar protocols to the one that we did before, but obviously you're working around the, the diameter of the centre circles. And again, this is just really nice because it, it kind of shows you that geometry doesn't have to be complicated, and, it, and in fact the easier it is, the more simple it is, the more beautiful it is. But it's, a, it's about the creativity of creating the pattern and design in the first. Just thinking about what you've drawn here, most crop circles obey the rule of hospitality and they provide a room for the visitor to walk around the design without further damaging the crop. Drawing in these flattened lines is a further complication for the geometer. So, um, I don't know if I've got a drawing of this here. There we go, yeah. So, in order to draw those lines in, um, we're essentially drawing the same again, but either, but a little bit. I think I've done these on the inside here. Just drawing them on the inside. So you're creating the pattern with the with the compass a little bit narrower, going round again to create um, these lines. 
Yeah, we can have a go at it, folks. It doesn't for this for the purpose of this exercise, it doesn't matter how wide those lines are, but just have a go at it because it it kind of just gives you a feel of the extra complication of the rule of hospitality. Yeah, keep on keep on keep the point on the original six, but then you just narrow in the the, the <laughs> diameter just slightly <laughs> so that when you draw them in, you're essentially drawing a line on the inside of where you've already drawn. Kind of cool. Yeah, just a tiny little fraction narrower. Ooh, we can do a load of that. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you see, you're already becoming ninjas. It's fantastic. <laughs> I just learned how poor I am at geometry as well, which is always good. It's always helpful to get humble. I mean, well, well, you're, one you're not sitting in front of it. Particularly <laughs> difficult. Yeah, you are. You're better. One of the things that is particularly difficult about doing this, especially doing the crop circles, is that essentially to begin with, you're working with an overhead photo, and um, normally what I do is I'll take one of Steve's overhead pictures, I pop it in Photoshop, get it so that it's bang over the top because whenever you're photographing there's always a slight perspective you never get bang over the top you work it so it's bang over the top I blow it up and then I draw over the top of the photo printed out so that I make sure that it's always correct and, and, and sometimes like with this one it took me a while to work out how to draw it you know because you get your compass you're putting it on points you're thinking oh does it go this way no it doesn't it doesn't do that you know and that's really where a lot of the time is taken up, is actually figuring it out. Did you note down how you got to that point? Oh yes, I have a great big, actually I have a great big fat book, and it's full of kind of like preliminary drawings and measurements and, and all kinds of stuff, because you forget. You know, sometimes coming back to this, you know, I think the last time I did this, I don't know, it was maybe a couple of years ago or something, and just coming back to the, oh yeah, quite, how does that work, you know, because I draw quite a you know, a lot of circles, so sort of coming back to them, you think, oh, yeah, well, I can't remember, can I remember how this one sort of goes together. But. Can I share a point? That yeah. when, when I'm drawing geometry, that, like, there's this really nice uh, aspect to it where, um, I don't know if anybody felt lost there at any stage, you know, where it's like, you know, there's a simple exercise, and it's like, so the pencil goes here and the point goes there and you move that arc and it all comes together like that. Yeah. But I'll often be trying to do something in geometry and I just won't have access to it. It's almost like I'm sort of being omitted from being able to get my head yeah. around yeah. this kind of click point <laughs> where when I finally get there, I go, it all just is so simple and so clear. You know, that I'm like, oh my god, I completely know what I'm doing. That pencil goes there, the pencil goes there, the arc goes there. And I literally, literally just almost enter this world where it all makes sense, you know? Then I go make a cup of tea and I can come back and I'd be like, oh god, what are the pencils? What's a cup of tea? You, know, like, you know, so it has that effect, you know, it has that kind of, you know, so you do break through to a place where it's like, it's really quite magic where it's like, oh my god, it just, it all clicks, you know? So, so I suppose my point is not to get disillusioned when you're like, oh, I can't get my head around this at all, you know, it's, like, it's part of it, you kind of, you, you go between these two, I almost look at it like a kind of a cling film barrier almost, you know, where sometimes when I'm not clicking with it, I'm, I'm like just not in the zone almost, and then when I am in the zone, it's like, oh, I got it, you know, it's a, and that's, it's, a, it's a nice feeling when that happens, you know. And so, yeah, and, and, and again, it's kind of, there's a psychological aspect to it, because sometimes, I, you know, <coughs> look at, and I'll be doing a drawing and I'm really stuck, and there we go. And, so, and I always go back to when I was doing my psychological training and my supervisor used to say to me, just stay with the pain, stay with the pain and you work through it. You know, don't get up and leave, just work your way through it. And actually it's really good advice is just actually just stick with it. I mean, sometimes if you really are frustrated and you think you're gonna you know, give yourself a headache from banging your head against the wall, then yeah, walk away and have a cup of tea. But, Sometimes just staying, staying with the, the, 
I don't know, it's not pain, but it, it's like, <laughs> yeah, or stay with the frustration and just, you know, work your way through it, or the block, yeah. stay with the block, and just, you know, try and work your way through it. So, there we go. So, you can, I don't know if the compass will open wide enough to draw the, the circle. Just to show you, yeah. Um, but, um, that is essentially the centre rows. And you'll, you'll notice when you're um, doing your drawing that, um, um, that you'll see here how these are bits are not connected because of the this rule, people, rule of hospitality and so on. Now, there's a little bit of protocol here because normally when drawing crop circles, um, they're usually created to begin with as a a black and white drawing, and the black always denotes the flattened crop and the white the standing crop. It's kind of like the, the, the protocol. And, and that's because just working in black and white, if you were to do it the other way around, then it means all the paper would have to be black. So we do it this way around. But you can see by looking at some of the... Let's go back to the, go back to the photo of this. There. You can see that um, that it's kind of the other way around when you see the photos. Do you see what I mean? So the, the lighter parts and the flat parts and the dark parts are standing, but when drawing it, it's the other way around. And you have to be very careful. There are so many times that I've got to to a painting and I'm um, you know doing all the drawing and then realise that I've coloured a little bit in black. <laughs> and this just because I work in it, there's no way back. It's like rip it on and start it. Again. <laughs> So, um, um, so that was my opinion to the formation. So, Right, now there is one further aspect of um, the hexagon that I think we should um, just have a quick look at. How are we doing time-wise, Jeff? Well, I, might, I was hoping to maybe have a cup of tea before five, so... Yeah, um, yeah let's just, we'll just talk this one through then. Um, <coughs> this is, we've been drawing six-fold geometry and there is a special relationship between the hexagon and the cube. So, um, with two dimensions, we have up and down and left and right, but with three dimensions, we have up, down, left and right, and backwards and forwards, and therefore we move from four to six, yeah? Mm -hmm. So up, down, left and right is, yeah, it's two dimensions, and then we move into three where we get six, up, down, left, right, backwards and forwards. And here we, we showed this earlier, this is the Allington cube, and, um, and this is a cube, it's, it's kind of four-dimensional, well, it's three-dimensional, but it's the number four. But here, if we cut the centre out, we can see that it's essentially a hexagon. Yep? So I'm, I'm just going to walk you through through this. We won't, we won't have time to draw it today. So we walk around, we divide by six, and then we create our hexagon by connecting those dots together. And then, yeah, if we join every other point with the centre, we get a cube in perspective. And that's the relationship between the two. And we've seen this used here, this fantastic one. This was uh, Dane Green, 2010. Again, the cube created using hexagonal geometry. This one, this is uh, Clay Hill, 2012. Again, this is sorry. Just to, <coughs> again, this is it's it's a cube. It's used hexagonal geometry, but obviously with bits cut out of it. It is absolutely fantastic. This is uh, Osbury Camp, 2010. Again, you can see the cube in the centre. Now what is interesting about the relationship between four and six is it's not just about the move from two to three dimensions, it can also be the point at which we move from three to four dimensions. And actually this is a, a stylistic representation of a tesseract or a four dimensional cube. 
and then this. This is the mother of all cubes. This was at Hackpen Hill in 2012. Absolutely stunning, stunning formation. <coughs> Again, using the hexagon to create the, the cube geometry. Again, we looked at this one earlier. This is the, the seal of Solomon using six. This is my drawing of the um, Hackpen Hill formation, which took me about four days. Um, and um, <coughs> I think I worked at slightly bigger than A3 on that, but it was really, really finicky to do. Karen, did you work out all the dimensions? Yes. <laughs> but, <coughs> yes, but as we've shown today, it's not necessarily about measurements, it's about ratios and mm -hmm. relationships. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, Michael and I, Michael Whitman and I, have a protocol where we only need a couple of measurements in the field, and from that we can construct the rest um, because it's about the relationships. Once you've got one or two key measurements, the, the rest. And if you're also, if you're drawing from the photo and you've got it bang over the top, and you can tell whether you've got it bang over the top because the compass will draw an exact circle over the top. If it's slightly over, you're off, and so on. But if you're drawing over the top, you're going to get it right every time as well. So again, there's not necessarily any need to know the measurement from the field. You can work with the, um, the, the ratios and proportions because you're drawing from the original. Is that on the Photoshop program? Yes, yeah, yeah. This is, um, this is uh, my Borg cube. Um, and um, this is um, a lovely little thing that I found on the internet. It's all made from magnetic cubes, but it's exactly the same number of cubes as the one in the Hackpen Hill formation. So I saw that and I absolutely had to have it. Now, just to give you a, a little taster before we end and have a cup of tea, I want to show you how geometry doesn't just relate to space, but it also relates to time. So in this Hackpen Hill 2012 formation, it was a 6 by 6 by 6 cube, yeah? Mm -hmm. And it contains 216 individual cubes. It all also has 4 by 90 degrees on it, each of its six sides, the cube. And this is a total of 2,160 degrees. Um, so these numbers peel back yet another layer of geometry, and that's its link to time. 2,160 years is one great year, i.e. the time it takes for one zodiacal age to give way to another. And because that happened at the end of 2012, it was so fitted into the, the whole spirit of the age. So, um, you know, 2012 was seen as the kind of approximate end of the age of Pisces giving way to the new age of the Pisces. <coughs> And so the formation, not only was it beautiful, perfect, it was also prescient in, in ways that just makes me tingle. It's, you know, absolutely fantastic. And also I saw this, which is Leonardo da Vinci's polyhedra, which looks very much like some of the, the formation. So, it's gone on there, but we can see it, I think. So... Here are some of the platonic solids that we've been talking about. Um, these are the, the three-dimensional shapes um, that Plato identified, and each of these also correspond to periods of time. Um, so um, at the top there we've got the tetrahedron, which has a total of 720 degrees. 72 is, and these can work in various um, multiples of 10, but 72 is the, the number of one age of precession, which is um, very important when you're thinking about astronomy and also about the changes of these zodiacal ages. Again, these have been known about by humankind for millennia. And in fact, the number 72, 144, all these numbers come up in myths and, um, you know, and are passed down through the ages so that this kind of knowledge wasn't forgotten. We've forgotten it now. We're rediscovering it. Um, but these numbers are all very important. So the octahedron there, 1,440 years. And you can see from here how um, these correspond to various uh, points in, in Zodiac. I, I won't go into it all because it's, it's all rather lengthy, but I'll leave that up and you can come and have a look, look at it yourself. But, um, so yeah, well, look, I hope you enjoyed that, folks, and um, that you got something out of it. And um, 
you know, that I've given you the bug <laughs> for, for geometry and, and drawing some of the circles. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Yes, of course. Yeah. Um, just in relation to the um, measurement um, versus not measurement, okay? I, I'm, I'm yeah. probably not going to wear this very well. But yeah. I tried to draw my first mandala because I've always used templates. Yeah. Design I tried to draw my first one recently and it was um, a, a triangle inside a circle but then comprised of gazillions of little triangles, okay? Right, yeah. And I figured that the dimension was that the, the big triangle was um, six centimetres, you know. Yeah, the, each length. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the, the small ones, I think there were three. But anyway, I killed myself measuring each friggin' little triangle. And then at the end, and it was slightly kibosh. Because right. you're never going to get it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So then afterwards, I looked at him and I went, "Well, frick that! Why did I go and measure it in each single uh, triangle? Because actually, when I look at it, it just the ratio of it is it, it just happens by itself. Yeah. It's in alignment. Yeah. So I've been sort of forcing this perfection that's never going to happen. Yeah. And if I just kind of gone, oh, yeah, sure. So are you better off just honouring the kind of the perfect ratio and forget the, the actual measuring? Do you see what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. 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 Wherever okay. possible, it's okay. always best to let the geometry unfold itself. Okay. Yeah. Rather than trying to measure out everything. Because you, when you're measuring things, it, you're going to be you're going to be inaccurate to some degree. Yeah. So if the if like the geometry we've done today is kind of self-evolving, it kind of works in in of itself. Then it's much better to do that. I mean, with your triangle, you know, you can divide each uh, side of the triangle just the line. Say you divided each by three and then created a grid by joining them all up and then put your triangles however you wanted them. Because uh, sometimes that's how some of the crop circles work, that there's an underlying lattice or grid and then they're created on, on the top of that one as part of it. But, yeah, I mean, wherever possible, I always find the most edifying shapes are those where, where they just unfold themselves. And, you know, and those are sort of close to the sort of real archetypes of, of geometry and, and shape. It was quite amusing because as I started it, it was, it was okay, in my head it was a three-dimensional form and yeah. that's what I was trying to achieve, but yeah. you know, what I was doing was just <laughs> messing around with yeah. the I think so called measure or to not measure, like yeah. is to never measure. Yeah. I'm, I'm so weird, really. Because I thought I had to. Never use. Okay, There's brilliant. no fun if it has to be measured. Brilliant. It just it's brilliant. I need. Yeah. Yeah. So all the magic happens when you free yourself from perfect. No one, two, three for none of it needed, you know. It all gives birth to itself. I kind of figured it out afterwards. Like, yeah, but that's cool. But that's, that's, the, that's, that's the worthwhile lesson, isn't it? Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, I mean, some of, some, of your, some, some of your greatest discoveries will be made from making mistakes. I mean, yeah. just as in yeah. life, you know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, and, and you know, the, the delight of this is just playing and just not mm. to put any pressure on yourself and just to play and to see what happens. And you, you learn from right. making mistakes or... You just learn, sometimes you'll just do something intuitively and it'll just work and you think, oh, yeah, you know, so, you know, it, it, you, it is just sort of giving yourself the time and the space to sort of just be at one with it and to play, not to put any pressure on yourself and eventually something will emerge but it doesn't have to emerge like in, in an hour or even two hours or even a day, you know, sometimes it's a slow process and you kind of just build it up. I'm just going to... Thank quickly you. flick through these, Jeff, because I, I think they were saying these are some of the <coughs> formations this year. This was a really peculiar little formation, but it's a parabolic curve. Have you ever heard of one of these? Mm -hmm. So it's basically where you use straight lines to create a curve on a grid. And this was just really nice. And again, the dimensions of this were lovely because, um, as you can see, there's an encompassing circle there, which is divided into four. And this, uh, this sits in the top, but then and you create this curve using these straight lines, but then when you put the compass in over the top, here we go, here's the compass on, on the top, and let's just see if I can... So the compass point there is at the bottom, 
there's the line going through the centre, which is just, there's the perimeter. I know you can't see this very well, but the perimeter sort of goes around here. Here's the line. The compass point is where the line meets the perimeter. And you see how it just creates, and that curve, you know, matches that beautifully. <laughs> Here was a, another one. This is based on the geometry of three and six. And this just shows you some of the... I work with inks and watercolours. This was an idea that Michael and I were playing with that just didn't quite sit right. However... However, the, the mistake I made was not actually scaling this up to meet the centre. And actually, when you scale it up to meet the centre, you can fit six of those shapes all the way around the formation. Oh. And the golden section. So the, these wonderful things here are called golden section calipers. And um, I use them all the time to look for the golden section in, um, um, in, in crop circle designs. Um, a guy from... Um, New Zealand made these and they're just particularly beautiful because they're made using these curves. Some of them can be quite kind of look like mechanical teeth, they can be, but these are just perfect for crop circles. So you can see here that you've got this dimension to this dimension is the golden section. So and you find this a lot in a, you know in a lot of the crop circles. Here was the basic drawing of one from Kepworth in Worcestershire. This is the final this is beautiful, it's eightfold geometry. This one at Hod Hill, this was gorgeous, this kind of like um, almost a labyrinth in the middle. So you work your way around all the way into the centre there. Absolutely gorgeous design that was. And there again is the golden section at work one way. And then also the other way. And just placing the, the circle, but it's really yeah. cool. Can you point out the golden cir uh, circle there? Can you point it out? Is there? Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's uh, this is the shorter ratio from the top of that circle there to the bottom of the centre circle, and then the longer is from the bottom of the centre circle to bottom of this circle okay. at the bottom. Yeah. Okay. And this was Chilcom Down. Now this is a spiral now. Drawing spirals with a compass and a straight edge is really, it, it's hard and um, it, it took me quite a while to get this one done. But here's, here's the basic preliminary drawing. Can you see that I've even gone off the page here? But um, this, is, um, this is one solution from one of John Martineau's little wooden books. And um, basically where you use this measurement here and this measurement here. So you're creating this here and then you move the compass there to draw that one there and so on and you repeat it all the way around. It's only a, an approximation of a true spiral but it's the only way to do it with a compass and straight edge. Mm -hmm. and that's the final. And that was wonderful because that's actually more Morse code and it reads no more war. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. More hexagonal, um, more pentagonal geometry there in Worcestershire. Here's one from South End on Sea. Again, this is sort of nice six. There's no particular. Is there a particular ratio? Like with circles, you can see that there's a ratio of diameters, radius, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, is again, I, I would work from always from the photograph. Okay. So, you so know, you're, you're, there's you're, no particular ratio yeah, involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if that, that took you like days to draw, and that just appeared over right in the field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, look, there's the golden section again in this one. Wow. Brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. All mm -hmm. golden. Do you have a photo of that one? Uh, in the field? Uh, um, uh, yes, I'm I don't worry, do it somewhere. Um, this was a fantastic one, <coughs> Six Penny Handling, oh. which um, Jeff spent some time in this <laughs> summer. Yeah. And again, this is a pencil Favorite. drawing that I used to draw it up. You'll notice that this ring here, which is used to size some of the circles, didn't appear in the field. Mm -hmm. And very often, again, you find that with circles where in order to draw them, you need more lines and, and things in the field than, than are actually there. I love that one. Yeah. Yeah. It is absolutely. 
we made a festival here, Karen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen the pictures. Yeah, yeah, Tiny and Mark and yeah. and Sharon, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I still love it, I have to say. We, we made quite she Hill the same, yeah. same year, but... Yeah. I'm sorry you can't see some of these pencil lines yeah. yeah. very well. Nice oh, yeah, well, you've got... But this gives you an idea. I'm this is... Um, this is a beautiful marriage of circular and pentagonal geometry. And, the, you know, this is this works really, really simply by drawing the outer ring, then dividing it by five. You connect the five points, then you draw another circle in, connect the five points all the way to the centre until when you reach the centre, you draw in the, the five-pointed star rather than the pentagon. That absolutely beautiful. No measuring needed for that at all. There's the final mm -hmm. painting. Here's another one. This one was interesting um, because um, instead of like the, the, the one I showed you previously, this time what's key here is there are circles, but what's key here is the, these placements of these points. And um, that's what anchors the, the whole shape into place. That's mm -hmm. as far as I got with this. And if you want to look at any of those um, pictures in the field, they're actually in the yearbook, which I've got here. With all, and I've also got some cards here with some of my paintings. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you.